All right. So let's see here. This is um, one of the first. Hi. Good to see you all this morning. You're all awake. So right away, we're in the right direction. So you had a cardiology lecture here, and we're going to go back through the old times. So in the old times, we were amazed by stuff we take for granted now in cardiology. And so when we were trying to figure out who would survive a surgery back in the 70s, um, there's a guy named Goldman who in this New England Journal article wrote about things that we all now take for granted. So he looked at uh, um, signs of heart failure, active heart conditions like prior MI, severe aortic stenosis, you know, um, just poor medical condition in general, um, S3, sign of active heart failure, all these things. And he put a, um, a point value basis on it. And the higher the point value, the less likely you were to survive the surgery. And of course, we take all that for granted now. But this was the start of risk calculators and trying to figure out uh, cardiovascular risk. Um, ooh, how do I go back one? Right there. There we go. All right, so a careful history and physical looking for features suggesting increased cardiac risk should be performed. You should look at functional capacity. Active conditions, obviously, more important than dormant ones. So if you have a heart attack now, obviously, more important than having a heart attack six months ago. Type of surgery, low versus high risk, and the urgency of the surgery. An abdominal crisis usually requires immediate surgery without further workup. Um, a creatinine greater than two is an independent risk, mac, uh, risk marker for uh, cardiovascular problems. And in vascular and prostate surgery, um, basically hematocrits less than 28 are the same way. So lab work does help you. Um, we used to have low intermediate and high risk procedures and then have these complicated algorithms about what to do about the patients. Well, now it's simpler. Now you're either low a uh, low risk procedure or not a low risk procedure. So a low risk procedure would be uh, cataract surgery, breast biopsy. I don't think anybody in this room is going to be doing that. Um, or elevated procedure risk. And in an elevated procedure risk, your MACE is more than 1%. Um, and so you lump the intermediate and high risk procedures together. So the new thing is cardiac risk calculator. So while I'm talking and you're falling asleep, if you have your phones right now and you have access to the internet, you should go to www.surgicalriskcalculator.com and you can download the app right now and then you won't have to page me at 2 in the morning. The, um, um, the revised cardiac risk index is one of the um, um, indexes for cardiovascular surgery that we've had for a long period of time or predicting cardiac events. The problem is it doesn't do a very good job for vascular surgeries, and this is the vascular symposium. So um, rather than um, downloading the revised cardiac risk index, you should be downloading the vascular study group of New England cardiac risk index, which more accurately predicts in hospital cardiac events after vascular surgery. Uh, because the revised cardiac risk index under emphasizes the bad things. Hmm. Onward. Doo -doo. All right, excellent functional capacity. Uh, if you're at Wimbledon playing singles tennis, uh, if you play football uh, for free time or uh, basketball, uh, that's good. More than 10 mats, life is good. Moderate, you can climb up a flight of stairs, walk up a hill. Uh, you can golf without a caddy in Texas. That would, I would argue that's strenuous, but uh, in general, they say it's moderate. If you can scrub floors, move heavy furniture. Um, poor is like, uh, a guy who comes into clinic and says, oh, doc, I exercise all the time. Every Saturday, I go out with my buddies, drink some beer on a golf cart, and play 18 holes. Well, that's actually poor functional capacity. That doesn't count. Uh, granny comes in and says, hi, I bake every Saturday morning. That doesn't count either. So ballroom dancing doesn't count. So if that's all you do for exercise, you have a poor functional capacity. All right, so bear with me. This is the noisiest slide I have. And if you can get through this, you got it made. And I think you know most of it. So. Um, in that tiny, you know, tiny wording up there, it said, patient is going to have a surgery. If it's, a, if it's an emergency, you go to the right and say, okay, go ahead and do your emergency surgery. Um, next question, is the patient having an acute coronary syndrome? Are they having a heart attack in front of your eyes? Uh, if so, please treat that first. And that's the next box. So once you get past that, then it says, okay, well, then what is your risk? And so that's why you just downloaded that risk calculator and you have it handy and you punch everything in. And if you're, since we're doing the vascular form, I'm going to tell you that it's going to be rare indeed that you're going to like calculate the risk and it's going to be low risk less than 1%. So really, for all practical purposes, for 90 some percent of your cases, you're going to be at a part where it says elevated risk, step five. 
And at elevated risk, here's where the nuances of cardiovascular stuff come in, because then it says if you are at moderate or greater exercise capacity, you're not having a heart attack, it's not an emergency, um, you, if you have, if you play singles tennis, for instance, you have a great functional capacity, how many of your vascular patients play singles tennis? Um, well, then they don't need any further testing, and uh, based on two, uh, two A indication, they can go straight to surgery. If they uh, have moderate capacity, they can walk up a flight of stairs or they can walk up a hill, you could justify doing no further testing on them, and that would be a 2B and go straight to surgery. However, if, so let's uh, picture a typical patient who's had claudication for a month or, or several months or a year, and now they've got, uh, now it's getting worse and they come in to see you. Well, obviously, they're good, their functional capacity is either poor or unknown. Unknown meaning like, well, if their leg were fine, maybe they could run up a few flights of stairs, but there's no way to know it because they haven't done that for months or years. So if it's unknown or if it's poor, well then, uh, if it's going to change your management, meaning you have time to do something about it, well then it should get a pharmacologic stress test, and that's a 2A. Then based on that, you do coronary vascularization and no revascularization, and we'll talk about what you would revascularize and how in a couple minutes. So the beta blocker saga. So does anybody know about some of the changes about beta blockers in the last few years? So um, the happy side of the story was in the 90s where they looked at beta blockers and they showed how helpful they were. And in fact, this is one of the early studies in the New England Journal looking at a small number of patients, a couple hundred, and Mangano gave these patients a tenolol and they followed them for a couple of years. And basically there was a mortality benefit. It's, uh, in the six months after hospital discharge, it was pretty imp impressive. And, it was, and uh, there was a benefit from a decrease in mortality from cardiac causes. Well, it's only 200 patients, so obviously you're going to have to do more data. So Polderman's does a study called Decrease 1. He looks at 100 patients, and he uh, does uh, dobutamine stress echoes on them, and he gives them bisoprolol, which is more beta-selective. And basically, he showed this number. This, uh, the mortality was... Uh, uh, death or MI was 3.4% in those receiving beta blockers versus 33.9% in placebo. Now, when this came out, that led to a whole bunch of editorials talking about how expensive healthcare is and why even do stress tests on these people. You could just potentially give everybody a beta blocker and everybody would live forever. Um, and, of course, there were mechanisms why it was plausible, right? In other words, it... Uh, it changed fibrillation thresholds, it stabilized plaques, it decreased uh, myocardial oxygen consumption. Um, so then they do a big study. So instead of 100 patients, 200 patients, they do over 8,000 patients called a POISE trial. And they randomized these patients to metoprolol succinate versus a placebo. And they gave these people high doses of metoprolol succinate. So if you're a cardiologist and somebody comes in and you're going to start them on a beta blocker, I, in my entire life, have never started anybody on 100 milligrams of metoprolol succinate immediately right off the deck. I would start a lower dose. So, but they put this in the trial because they said, look, this is it. We're going to prove once and for all people live forever with beta blockers. We're going to make sure they're beta blocked. And so basically, when you read this, they got 100 milligrams of metoprolol succinate two to four hours before surgery, unless the heart rate was less than 50 or the systolic was less than 100. And they looked at a, a combined endpoint, death, arrest, non-fatal MI, and it was reduced mainly due to non-fatal MI. So they said, aha, of course. But then they counted all the bodies and not everybody answered the phone. And they said, aha, uh -huh, weird, the 30-day mortality was higher as well as stroke, hypotension, and bradycardia. Well, that's just because we, maybe we gave just a smidge too much. I mean, obviously, the concept works, right? But then Polderman's, the guy who did the, the, one of the original trials, was accused of academic misconduct, and several of his beta blocker trials were brought into question. Oops. So then they said, wait a minute, we got a problem now. We did these guidelines on beta blockers, and this guy is uh, controversial, shall we say. So let's look at nine secure trials totaling 10,000 patients and get rid of the one where this guy was involved in, and all of a sudden most of the data went away. And so in the secure trials, there was a decrease in MI, right? But again, there's an increase in hypotension and stroke and a 27% increase in mortality. So now in this incredibly wordy slide, I emphasize the yellow stuff. Um, if you have uh, good eyesight, you can read that. So class one means do it. Beta blockers should be continued in patients undergoing surgery who've been on beta blockers chronically. 
class three, harm. This is new. Beta blockers should not be started on the day of surgery. And that's from the POIS trial. Um, and in 2A and 2B, you can read all that during your leisure, but basically it's individualized. Nobody knows. There's not enough data. You're going to waste your time if you memorize that. Um, so without the decreased studies, there was insufficient data on beta blockade started two or more days before surgery. And although POIS used a high dose of beta blockers and was criticized for it, smaller doses showed a similar signal of the same problem, increased stroke, hypotension, and bradycardia. So they got to do more randomized controlled trials to eva uh, evaluate the use of beta blockers started several days prior to surgery, preferably with more selective agents like atenolol or bisoprolol rather than metoprolol. Um, Preoperative uh, coronary vascularization is usually not indicated to lower the risk of a non-cardiac surgery. So I'm going to stent somebody to just get them through the next surgery. Probably not indicated, or if it is, just for a small number of high-risk patients. And again, the timing of revascularization, the timing of the procedure depends on really what's going on. One of the seminal papers came out of our hospital years ago. Kaluza and Raisner looked at just a handful of patients. These patients were having aneurysm resections. And they were all dying. They are all bleeding and they are all having heart attacks. And the idea back then was, okay, we'll put a stent in, send them to surgery, life will be good, everything will be fine, and they would have a myocardial infarction and die, which was odd. And so rather than just, you know, uh, bury the dead bodies, what they did was they actually published the paper and said, hey, look, you know, this might be a minor problem sticking stents in people and sending them to surgery. And they recommend waiting after you put a bare metal stent in. They didn't have drug eluding stents back then. So now all this goes on and on and on, and I'm down to three minutes, but basically, um, before planning a stent, uh, for a drug eluding stent, the physician should talk to the patient and say, hey, you really should take your aspirin and your thenopyridine like Plavix for a year. If you're planning to have an elective surgery, you pro we probably shouldn't put in a drug eluding stent. Um, prior to discharge, uh, um, it's important that, uh, treating cardi uh, that uh, you contact your treating cardiologist before stopping any antiplatelet therapy, even instructed to stop it by another healthcare provider. I'm just going to read this out loud just for a moment. Healthcare providers who perform invasive or surgical procedures and who are concerned about periprocedural and postprocedural bleeding must be made aware of the potentially catastrophic risk of premature discontinuation of phenopyridine therapy. Such professionals who perform these procedures should contact the patient's cardiologist. Issues regarding the patient's antiplatelet therapy are unclear to discuss optimal patient management strategy. Elective procedures where a significant risk of preoperative or postoperative bleeding should be deferred until the patient has completed an appropriate course of therapy. For drug eluding stents, that's 12 months. For bare metal stents, that's one month. For patients treated with DES who are to undergo subsequent procedures and mandate discontinuation of phenoparidine, aspirin should be continued if at all possible and phenoparidine is resumed immediately. So, for elective not, now a, a new change is that elective non cardiac surgery after drug eluding stent could be considered after 180 days. But the risk of further delay is greater than the expected risk of ischemia and stent thrombosis. Um, if you use a bare metal stent, you should wait for a month. If you do a balloon angioplasty, you should wait two weeks. Valvular heart disease, severe aortic stenosis. You can operate on somebody with severe aortic stenosis. Tell the anesthesiologist you're going to have to be very careful. You may not make it through, but you probably make it. Uh, mitral stenosis, again, risk of heart failure, but you can probably make it through. AIMR, you probably make it through. HCM, avoid hypotension and anemia. Remember that worsens dynamic outflow of tract obstruction. If you have heart failure, uh, you obviously should do an echo on them. If they had prior heart failure, it's reasonable to do an echo on them. And you should always do EKGs. So in summary, history and physical help guide appropriate therapy and testing. Functional capacity uh, provides important information. Cardiac risk calculators are available. Treatment with beta blockers in the perioperative period are individualized. Elective surgery should be postponed four to six weeks in patients with bare metal stents and a year with drug eluding stents. All right, questions. 65 year old guy is a non diabetic, is scheduled to have cataract surgery, plays double tennis, no prior cardiac history, a normal EKG. What would you guys do, everybody? Of course you would. 65 year old male just had a bare metal stent deployed in his LAD with a good angiographic result. He waits knee surgery for severe arthritis, which is greatly unres uh, unresponsive to medical therapy and is greatly affecting his lifestyle. He has minimal decrease. Uh, minimal diseases, other vessels are normally up. Recent data would suggest he should have A, immediate surgery, B, surgery after waiting two, four to six weeks or no surgery. Ding. Okay. And the last one, currently perioperative use of beta blocker should be? Two, one, boom. All right, there it is. All right, any questions? Well, I have a question. Yes. So, I mean. Uh, Where did I get this suit? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
So the, 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 I mean, the bad tab lockers, like you said, I mean, it's like they, they receive so much attention, but I mean, there's a lot of good data on ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers. How come they're not popular in the media and, you know, and, in the not, and not just scientific journals? I mean, right, you said like the New York Times and other journals that talk about how the bad tab blockers should be, you know, used all the time, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the problem is the hype often is, is bigger than the reality. Just like when a new device comes out, the hype is big, and then you yeah. figure out what's really going on. And so for calcium channel blockers, they never really showed a mortality benefit or really a decrease in MI. And for ACE inhibitors as well, this is for perioperative period. Obviously, for ACE inhibitors, diabetic, low EF, ACE inhibitors are good. Some patients, if you believe the HOPE study, um, like Ramipril, that would be a, a good agent. Statins, I think, should be in the water, don't tell anybody that, but I mean, uh, you, but you may have less procedures. <laughs> uh, um, so really it just depends on the question in particular. But the calcium channel blockers and ACE inhibitors really um, no clear cut benefit in the preoperative setting. Yes? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there's, I think, uh, I think you can think of um, thrombosis as two problems. One is not being on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, DAPT, and the other is the fact you get hypercoagulable with vascular surgeries. And so you get rid of one versus the other. And remember that the reason you have to wait for drug eluting stents is the stent hasn't completely endothelialized. And so really in your particular issue, if it was an emergency, you could go to surgery. If it was an elective surgery, you'd have to wait a minimum of six months, but then you'd have to really explain in your own mind, like, we really need to do this in six months because of, I don't know, he has a malignancy. He, he's going to lose his leg versus, well, I just need to have this selectively done. There was another question somewhere. Yes. No, the one, when you go to that surgicalriskcalculator.com and you click on it, um, you can actually uh, use that to download it onto your device. And so you go to surgical risk calculator, the one I told you about, it has probably a dozen calculators. But if you go to the one on vascular surgery, you'll find the one that you want that, we, that pertains to this lecture. Any other questions? No? All right, thank All right, you. Great, thanks, everybody.